Hey. I'm Annalie Newitz. I'm the editor-in-chief of io9. And um, before we get into our conversation, I wanted to be sure and thank uh, Brooke Hammerling and Brew PR, who helped put on this party. Thank you very much. And now, I think we don't need really to introduce Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, I, I just came down from my office, right? <laughs> so, I know. So he, thank he you for joining us. Up, yeah, exactly. He was just sitting up there listening to music. <laughs> so the theme of... Well, of, I have to say this. I have to say... Yes? Welcome to the universe. <laughs> okay. I have to say that. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Welcome to the center of the universe. That's even better. I think this, this crowd really likes exoplanets, so I think you're going to get the biggest cheer if you say something about exoplanets. We I'll, were, we were kind of... come up with something. Yeah, we were kind of going crazy in the planetarium. Um, so the theme of, of this evening is uh, first comes the dream. And one of the things that we are celebrating and thinking about tonight is kind of what inspires people to go into science and technology and innovation and so I'm going to ask you, what, what was it? I mean, what got you interested in astronomy? Was there a story or an event or a thing that happened? Yeah, my parents, I have a brother and sister, and my parents took the three of us, the five of us, every weekend we went to a different cultural institution in the city. It could be a museum, zoo, uh, of, of any kind, where adults are doing things that aren't the traditional uh, professions. So the opera, Broadway plays, Broadway musicals, hockey, and one of those trips was to the local planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium. At age nine, I was starstruck by what happened to me inside that dome. You go and it's a round room and you go just there, right? And the ceiling and the lights go out and the stars come out and it's as though I had no choice in the matter, the universe chose me. And so, so from age nine onward, I've known that I needed to be a piece, be a part of this universe. And, and so that, that, that's how I knew. It wasn't a person. It was an institution. Mm -hmm. It was this institution, the Hayden Planetarium of the American Museum of Natural History. <laughs> now, you need people later on. So it turned out the planetarium had educators. It had scientists on staff. And so when you sort of get through all the exhibits, if you're a, a regular, you're still hungry for more. And so I attended programs that were given here. I attended classes that were given here. I got to know the educators. I got to know the scientists. And so my role models were, my role model was an amalgam of various people who had talents in the exact places that I wanted to acquire when I became a grown-up. So it sounds like you were, you were inspired by people doing exactly what you wound up doing. And I'm wondering if you also were inspired by anything, you know, w one of the things we're intrigued by here is how imaginary stories, fantasies, science fiction can maybe inspire people to get interested in science and technology as well. Was there anything like that for you? Were there any stories that just made you go? No, I didn't happen to be one of those because the actual universe was intriguing enough it's cooler than it's, fiction. It's so cool because, right, you know, when I was in middle school, that's when black holes sort of were born in our consciousness. The mathematics of black holes first surfaced. And once you understand what a black hole can be and what it can do, and then you look at unsolved problems in the universe and you say, hey, wait a minute, maybe there's a black hole there. And in fact, we would later learn that there's a supermassive black hole in the center of every galaxy we've ever, we've ever looked. So black holes become a fundamental part of our understanding of the universe, and I came of age at a time when they were just sort of formulated and came to be understood. So, uh, and black holes are cool. In fact, I was angered. Uh, no, that's not the right word. I was pissed off when, when the movie Black Hole came out. I was going to ask you about don't that. Don't get me started. Because real life black holes don't, don't, are so much cooler. That than was that my movie. ten worst movies of all time. <laughs> ten, and I'm sorry, Ernest Borgnine was in that. It was his last movie. Ten worst movies of all time. People love that movie, though. I don't know. There's don't a ship in it and a wrong, 10 worst yeah. movies of all. I looked yeah. at it. I am in 10th grade or something. I forgot how old I was. And I knew more physics and, and of the universe than 
anyone dreamt of putting in that film. And here's this beautiful topic, a black hole. You can show bodies getting ripped apart, atom by atom, with the tidal forces. Y you could have blood and gore and excitement. And they didn't go any of those places. But you didn't like, you didn't like the grid? No, it was, it was <laughs> you know, they finally went into a black hole, and it, it looked like a place in the Southwest. You know, there's yeah. like rock formations and things. It's like, no, no. Yeah, so, no, it was bad. So anyhow, so I embrace science fiction. I, I, I love it as a consumer of it, but it itself never was doing the inspiring. It was the actual pace of discoveries that was enough for me. And I know that you had to miss a special screening of Batman to be here tonight, which were very I just want you to know, well, I'm not, I had preview tickets to the IMAX 3D Batman tonight. I'm just saying, but I'm here with you. I'm just saying. Give me a little more of that, just so I, thank you. <laughs> okay, I feel better now. All right. Yeah, no, that's good. Okay. You know, people learn a lot from, about science from pop culture, and I wonder, I mean, how do, you, how do you feel about that? Is there a way that you think we can intervene and make sure people are getting, learning about real science, accurate science from pop culture? I mean, I'm assuming Batman is not on your list of accurate science show well, movies. Well, okay, the advantage that Batman has over all the other superhero movies is that Batman is human, right? He doesn't have some power that, he doesn't become the Hulk, right? I mean, he's human, and so all of the accoutrements that he carries with him are interestingly imagined uh, tools that you could exist. And so... Theoretically. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I want some of what he's got on his utility belt, and <laughs> whereas I can't say, oh, I want to be a man of steel and fly through the air, I can't. That I can't imagine doing that, but I can imagine being Batman. So, but about science, but not minus the crazy part of it. So, but regarding science, I don't care if people get their science facts from pop culture because often they're more fantasy facts than actual facts. Like in Star Wars, all the ships make noise in space. In space, no, no, it's silent in space, all right? So, so what, what I care about is not those details. I care about whether what people, I care about whether that encounter with the science fiction storytelling inspires a person to want to learn real science. And good science fiction does that every time. And good, and, and good science fiction doesn't leave you thinking, yeah, that could happen tomorrow. No, it's like this is a fun and it's the fiction, but now let me go actually find out the facts behind it. And those are teaching moments. Those are occasions where people can transform what could be just an imaginative state into one where maybe they want to bring some of that imaginative state into reality. Now, if you take, for example, the original Star Trek, you know, they had the, 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 their communication device. It's a flip open top. What's interesting is that we used to have those, <laughs> right? That was the flip open cell phone, but then we actually went past that. So we went through 23rd century technology and now we're on to something beyond what was in Star Trek. So we're ahead of Star Trek. In that one way, yeah. yes. Um, <laughs> and then, <laughs> now I remember, now don't take future predictions from me because I remember watching Star Trek in real time when it came on in the evening prime time and seeing Captain Kirk and all these guys walk up, this is how old I am, they'd walk up to the door and the door would just open. And I said, oh, that'll never happen. Oh, that was the least believable, the warp drive, sure. You know, <laughs> photon torpedoes, sure. But how did the door know that they were walking? There's no, how did it know? And so, so, uh, so don't. Uh, so you're basically living in a Star Trek universe now. Uh, yeah, except for the, the except transporter. Except for the warp. Drive the, the, except for the warp yeah. drive, the transporter, the photon torpedoes, the, 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 the deflector replicator. shields, the replicator, and Klingons. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, it's the, <laughs> it's the Star Trek future. <laughs> so how do you see your work here at the museum doing um, some of that work that pop culture does, you know, bringing people into science and getting them excited about it and, you know, teaching them that there are no Klingons? <laughs> well, uh, the American Museum of Natural History is a unique place. 
and everyone who works here knows that. And people who grew up here know that. And, and we know it's unique on several fronts. First, it's a house of education. You come here to learn. But if it was only that, you can ask, did what you learn today, will that, is that the same tomorrow? Don't we learn something new? Doesn't, doesn't the frontier of science keep moving? That's an important bit of information there. How do you bring that in? So we are not only a house of education, we are a house of science. All right? There, there, uh, we have departments of science here in mammalogy and, and, and birds. Uh, what do you call the bird folk? Ichthy, ichthy, ornithology, thank you. <laughs> and all these ologies. Uh, and the research is conducted on the collections and on collections yet to be had. And in a sense, in astrophysics, our collections are the data that we have accumulated from the universe itself. Because it, you can't bring a black hole in for an exhibit. It doesn't work. Okay? I hope we do at some point, though. I don't hope good. we do that. No, I think, no. I think it's no. a goal. <laughs> no, you don't want to. No. Don't mess with that. No, yeah, yeah let the black hole be. Yeah. You want to <laughs> avoid black holes. So uh, astrophysicists don't have artifacts that we can just bring in and put up on display. And so, uh, so our data are just that. And so uh, I think all of you participated in one of those journeys through the data, uh, piloted by none other than Carter Emmert. Uh, he's our, our chief, yeah. <laughs> um, among the hats that he wears, he was like your driver through the universe. That's a cool, uh, that's a cool position to, uh, to have. So here we do both. And so it means we not only can teach you what is known, we can keep you abreast of what is on the frontier and what is still to come. And so it is that combination that makes this place um, almost magical because it's not static. It is a living, breathing organism. Not, not only that, we can tell the whole story. We've got the universe here, we've got cultures, we've got biology, and we stitch it all together like we, we think we do. We think we do it in a way so that you don't just come in, we're not just cabinets of curiosities. That's what museums used to be. If you go back 100 years and walk into a museum, there's a cabinet and here's a shrunken head and a bone and a pottery piece and with a little label, that was it. And here you come in and it's, and it's everything is brought to life. Everything becomes a story that connects data. And when you connect data and stories, you have knowledge and wisdom. This is, this is how people learn best. And I remember, you know, we have our Akeley Gallery, or Gallery of African Mammals. I visited South Africa for my professional uh, conferences, and we took an excursion to Kruger Park. Uh, it's a, it's a, a wild game preserve, and it's got, like, impala and, and, and you know, it's all the animals you, you, heard, you see on The Lion King, okay? And so I'm there, and I'm looking at the water hole, and I, I said, oh, this is awesome, because it looks just like the diorama in my museum. <laughs> so, the, so that's not the first time I had that kind of warped view of the actual world, because my world was, was established here in the institution. When I go to mountaintops with the clearest air there is, and I look up at the night sky, and I see the stars close enough that you can almost touch them, my first thought is, it reminds me of the Hayden Planetarium. <laughs> so that's kind of a sickeningly urban notion that the real things remind me of what was created here, but that's a testament to the precision and accuracy with which all of this is delivered to what are otherwise life-starved and star-starved New Yorkers. Yeah, and it was so fantastic when we were there. We were seeing data from yesterday, basically. We were looking at Earth data that had been gathered by satellites yesterday, and it was it That's was incredible. part of this moving frontier that yeah. you become a participant in rather than a distant observer of. So let's talk about space a little bit. So where do you think... Isn't that what we've been talking about? What? Let's talk more, okay. more <laughs> about space. Let's go deep into space. Um, I'm wondering, what do you think the future of humanity is in space? Where do you see humans being in a thousand years in space? Oh, okay. So here's my, if you want my dream state, I'll tell you. Yes, I want total dream state. Okay, okay. So plus I got to make sure that the head of NASA is listening. <laughs> <laughs> General Bolden is here, the head of NASA, and he's listening. So uh, my dream state, I, I'm not asking for much, I don't think. I just want... Uh, 
I want to turn the solar system into our backyard. That's what I want. But is that too much to ask? So I'm tired of saying, let's go to Mars and just Mars, and then when we get there, we'll think about what next to do. That's kind of what happened with the moon situation, right? All of NASA was organized so you go to the moon, then you get to the moon and look around, well, suppose I want to go over there. Nope, we don't have the vehicle for that. No, nope, we don't have the budget for that. We just set it up to go to the moon. I'm thinking, that's not how you explore. Exploration is go where you feel, go where, whatever's calling you, set it up so you can follow that urge. And so I, I don't think this is hard to do. You have an entire suite of launch vehicles that have different configurations. One configuration gets you to the near side of the moon. Another one gets you to one of these Libration Lagrangian points. Another one gets you to an asteroid. Another one gets you to the moons of Mars, to Mars itself. And whatever is the needs that we have as a culture, either a national culture or a world culture, they can be accommodated by different combinations of these boosters. You might want to mine an asteroid. That's this combination. You might want to find water at the poles of the moon. You got to bring in certain tools for that. You might want to have tourist jaunts to the near side of the moon. Science on the surface of Mars. Maybe you want to go to Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. That's where I want to go. I, I so want to go there. It's got an icy surface, but its gravitational interaction with Jupiter and the surrounding moons itself puts a stress on the physical body of that moon. And that stress is pumping energy to its insides, and it is melting that ice. So beneath this icy outer layer, it is liquid water and has been liquid for billions of years. I want to go ice fishing on Europa and see if something swims up to the camera lens. That's what I want to find out. And of course, if you find life on Europa, you found Europeans, right? That's how, <laughs> what, that's what that, what, what else would you call Europa life, right? So, and you're proposing that our first move with Europeans is we'll, we'll eat them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they're tasty. I, yeah, I don't know if I'm hungry, yeah, and if it's women. If, I, I'll cook up some fish on Europa. Uh -huh. if I, so, <laughs> what it means is, whatever might be the needs, be they geopolitical, cultural, economic, or scientific, the solar system becomes our backyard. And that's no different psychologically or fundamentally or intellectually from if you move into a new neighborhood, you explore what's out there. You find out where the grocery store is, where the playgrounds are, where the movie theater is. You, get, you grow accustomed to what's there. But for people to say, oh, I'm okay, I, we got problems here on Earth. Let's just worry about these. Meanwhile, the asteroid's on its way. The sun is exploding. Oh, no, I'm just worrying about Earth here. Earth is my concern. And this is the, as short-sighted a perspective as you could possibly have. Now, do you realize that the universe has no shortage of energy? I once tweeted that I'd be embarrassed if an alien landed and I had to tell the alien, you know, we're still pulling our energy out of the ground, OK? We still fight wars over where we're going to get oil from dead plant life from millions of years ago. We'd be the laughing stock of aliens in this galaxy. I'd be embarrassed to tell them that's how we're still making our fuel. Get me started. I want, I, want to, I want aliens to be proud of what we've done. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I do too. Plus, wait, 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 plus. Plus, you know, when the asteroid comes, I don't want to be the laughing stock of the galaxy when they learn that we went extinct from an asteroid impact, even though we had a space program. That is just embarrassing. Okay, if you have a space program, you could like deflect the asteroid. Oh, by the way, the kind of people I want in my midst, all right, here, here's the world I don't want to be in. Here comes the asteroid. Run! Buy toilet paper and water, <laughs> stockpile food. These people are not into solutions, all right? So, asteroid comes. You're filled with scientists and engineers in your midst. Their first thought is not, run. Their first thought is, how can I deflect that asteroid? That's who you want around you. Or how can I gather enough data so I see that asteroid coming 20 years away, right? Oh, yeah, ideally, yeah. That you want that's, to, that's what we really oh, want. Oh, yeah, you want the early data. Yeah. <laughs> Early date is good. Yeah. And so, yeah, and, 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 and so, so finishing my plan, if I were like Pope of Congress, 
you have to be Pope because Pope talks to God and makes it true, right? So, so Pope of Congress, I say, we need to do this. I can quote Kennedy, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. By the way, the more hard things you do, the more la rungs of a ladder you ascend. And the fewer other people end up around you, that's what it means to accomplish something hard. And the more hard things you accomplish, the greater is the generation of your uniqueness in this world. And so I see so many people just taking the easy way out, and I'm thinking, why? You have one time through life, do something hard. I was solving the Rubik's Cube recently, and someone said, oh, he said, how long does it take you to solve it? I said, I'm about three and a half minutes. You know, with the tailwind, I can do it about three and a half minutes. And they said, oh, I, I, I know some tricks. You can get it down to two minutes. I said, no, because then I just be doing your tricks. Uh, if I get it to two and a half minutes, I want to because I want to figure out how to get it to two and a half minutes. Then it's my achievement, not because I read a book. Oh, what good is that? You might as well, that's baking a cake. That's just following a recipe. You didn't invent something new. You didn't take your brain a new place that it hadn't been before. So I remember the 60s, that's how old I am, where the act of going to the moon was a statement of what our culture was capable of doing. And everyone was a participant, whether or not you were a scientist and engineer. If you were an artist, you were a, uh, 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 even comedians. My favorite joke of that era, Dick Gregory, 1962. We had just sent Ham up, the, the, the chimpanzee, and he came back. And Dick Gregory joked, he said, what NASA's not telling you is that that went up as an actual astronaut. <laughs> came back. <laughs> so... Anyhow, so, so you have people, everyone joins in. And when everyone joins in, the spacefaring dimension of your nation becomes part of your culture. How and do you that, think that we can get people to feel like they're joining in again? Because I feel like there's been a lot of pulling back. We don't have that feeling that we had in the 60s when there was the moon landing. So how do you see us, like how do you as a scientist and how do your colleagues, how do you think that you can get people right, excited sentence, about that right, huge project? Your sentence, well, no. It's not like, oh, we had that feeling during the moon landing. No, it's the act of going to the moon that generated that feeling. That just, like, let's get the causes and effects correct here. Right. Okay? The World's Fair in Flushing, New York, did not create the 60s. The attitude of the 60s created the World's Fair. And if you remember that, go get a book. Those of you who are younger than 50, whatever, however old you had to be, go get a book and just look at the pictures. It, it, we were thinking about tomorrow. It was all about tomorrow. The, the very unisphere itself, all right? You talk to the designer and say, oh, we just thought some rings would look good. Wait a minute, it's three rings. It's around the equator. And John Glenn had just come out of orbit and done three orbits around the Earth. Oh, you're going to tell me how you just thought of this? We had John Glenn making three orbits. Stuff going on in space was was being felt by sculptors, by artists, by comedians, by journalists, by everybody. It was part of the culture. And so I submit that if you make the, the solar system your backyard, then everybody's got a piece of what interests them in the, in the universe. And that, that, that becomes part of our culture again. People start dreaming about tomorrow, and the act of dreaming about tomorrow, when you have scientists and engineers and other STEM professionals in your midst, they make tomorrow happen by creating it and bringing it into the present. And that's the world I grew up in. And that's the world I don't want to, uh, that's the world I want to make sure I also die in. I don't want to be in a country where we just fade off the side of the cliff. That's kind of what's happening now. We didn't discover the Higgs boson. As a scientist, I don't care who discovers it. I'm glad it got discovered. I'm glad. But it was discovered in Europe, not in America. We would have had that thing nailed 1995. All right, we were building the superconducting super collider. There's an absence of adjectives there, creativity of adjectives. <laughs> Those are physicists. If had the astro folks been, we would call the super duper collider, I think is what we would have called it. But anyhow, we're, we're st got stuck with that. So Congress cut that budget. We would have found the Higgs boson and more beyond that. And so what was it in Europe? They discover the Higgs boson. When do they announce it? The morning of July 4th. They could have announced that Tuesday or Thursday, but no. They waited until it was our celebration, the day we choose to celebrate our own greatness, right? 
And I, I tweeted this. I said, here's our day, and Europe uses that day to remind us that we suck at science, okay? And, and people got angry. I it, thought that was Higgs boson day. I just, that was what I thought we were celebrating that day. Oh, that's why we had the fireworks. Yeah, oh. yeah. That was, that was kind of, that was what I thought was going on. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that, that. So, so, so. We've uh, got a, I think we've got a wind up. Okay. So I'm getting the, the signal from. Wind up or wind down? Wind, wind down. Thank you. Okay. Although, with a, with a thought of winding up into space, which isn't really what you do, unless you had some kind of. Yeah. We have better sources of energy than springs that you wind. Yeah. yeah, I think I yeah, think, I think NASA got that one figured yeah, out some time we're ago. We're beyond clockwork now. <laughs> I'm glad glad about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we got right. that one. Good. Well, thank you so much for being here and talking to us about going to space and how we really need to get our asses in gear and start thinking about turning the solar system into our backyard. Yeah, and by I'm, the way, I'm excited about that being. By backyard. the way, I want to do it because it's fun and it's discovery and it's exciting. But in a free, in a free democracy, I I can't require that you feel the same way, and, and I won't require it of you. But what I will, I will. but I, I'll alert you of the fact that NASA at its finest is a flywheel of innovation, not only from direct spin-offs that come about from that investment of talent that they tap. It is a flywheel because it is an engine of innovation that you feel across all sectors of society because you realize that that is what your culture is doing. It is what you're about. And, and you know, I, I saw, was it Snooky on TV last night? <laughs> and I said, why, how, wha, how, why? And I, you know, and we like blaming Snooky, you know, but it's not her fault that people like to watch her, all right? And then I thought, well, do we just yank her off the air because America is just descending faster? And I said, no, that's not the problem. The problem is we have not offered the viewer something greater so that when they say, I can watch Snooki or I can watch astronauts take the first steps on Mars, Snooki loses in that contest, all right? I'm pretty sure, Definitely. all right? And so, got nothing against Snooki, but the extent to which entertainment reaches for the lowest basal mental acuity, that is a statement that we're not reaching high enough. And I don't want to blame what that is. They're making money. This is what America does. But, uh, you know, even in the 60s, we had at least the Jetsons, you know. <laughs> I, want, I wanted some of that, you know. <laughs> it was... <laughs> so now you're admitting the Jetsons inspired you. So, so on that note, you guys can talk to. You'll be upstairs, right? Uh, oh, we. Oh, that's right. So you'll be. Uh, we'll be going to the scaling walk. Thank you. The scaling walk, which is two flights up from here, that is the relative sizes of everything in the universe, from the large scale structure of the universe down to the center of the atom, and you we're scaling forty four powers of ten, as you just walk around that scale. And that so is the entire known universe. So and some, basically eat that snooky, I think is what you're saying. Oh, eat that snooky. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one thing to just, to, so you lose sleep tonight, the electron is so small that we don't know how small it is. It is smaller than any capacity we have yet devised to measure its size. As far as we know, it is infinitesimally small. And so up there, when you have the sizes of things, these are only the sizes of things that we know the size of. The electron would be the smallest thing up there, smaller than the very smallest size scale that you're, is represented. And so check it out. It's the entire universe. It's our home. And it's my pleasure and honor to, to share our home with you in here, the Coleman Hall of the Universe. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> the Jetson. Jetson. <laughs>